Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the, the role of personal narrative and um, realizing that we're at an academic institution, um, I'm going to say something that's uh, probably very heretical and that's the sentence that science and uh, data don't drive public policy, that people drive public policy. And really examining the role that nar personal narrative can play in changing our framework not just about drug policy, but a whole host of issues. And I think all, all you have to do is think about things like climate change and immunization to realize the fact that uh, uh, you know, it's not our scientific understanding that always wins the day. And it's really important for us to think about how do we craft messages and who crafts the messages as important for changing public attitude and changing public policy. So, so I want to talk a little bit about kind of drug policy and what we think contributed to uh, some, I think, building changes to that. But also, how can we use personal narrative in a wide variety of ways to think about uh, changing, uh, particularly public policy, in an, uh, in an age of significant confirmation bias and really diminished scientific influence around, uh, around public policy work. So I'll, I, I want to start with an example of what I think has been an extreme change in a very short period of time as it relates to public attitude and public policy. And that's kind of both uh, uh, our public opinion and legal changes as it related to LGBT issues. Um, and so um, I offer um, kind of in the 1990s only about 25% of people knew someone who was openly gay or lesbian. We all knew people who were, who were gay or lesbian. They just, we just didn't know it and people weren't open about that. And in 2016, that increased to 87%. And you know, coincidentally, support for gay marriage uh, was up 45% since 1988. And so really kind of what, what um, kind of constituted those changes? Well, in no small part, it, it can be attributed to the simple fact that people came out, right? So they came out to their neighbors, to their friends, to their employers. Um, and we also began to see much more accurate media portrayals and much more sympathetic, if you will, personal narratives as it related to LGBT folks. So Ellen, Will and Grace, Orange is the New Black. We saw you know, this, this uh, 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 change in the arc of, this, of those stories. So no longer were LGBT folks the villain of stories, that they be, actually became the heroes of stories. And so in, in 2015, you know, fast forward that uh, the Supreme Court strikes, the, the strikes down the Defense of Marriage Act um, and legalizes same-sex marriage. And so this is where the personal and professional for me uh, come into play. So I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, uh, and my husband and I walk over to the steps of the Supreme Court. I still get chills when I talk about it. We walk over to the steps of the Supreme Court on the day that uh, DOMA was struck down. And it's just one of the most incredible experiences of my life, just being there with hundreds of people who are just celebrating this profound change. Um, but like many people who do substance use work, I'm very myopic, and everything relates to substance use issues, right? And I couldn't help but think like how far and how fast public opinion and public policy changed around LGBT issues, and why, in spite of the fact that we've had decades of scientific evidence that addiction is a disease, that we still cling, quite honestly, to punitive approaches uh, and still have significant negative views of people with substance use disorders. So I offer that as an example of how personal narrative and media portrayals and positive framing of stories can really change our public opinion. So just a, a little bit about my former office. I have a hard time saying former office. I can't let go. Um, but the, my office in Washington, we were uh, an office of the executive office of the president. Our, our task by Congress uh, was twofold, that we set the administration's drug control policy, right? So we set our strategy for the administration and how federal government was going to uh, reduce drug use and its consequences in the United States. Congress also gave us a very interesting authority as well that people quite honestly resented. So not only did we have strategy authority, but we had budget authority over those agencies. So we were able to tell federal agencies, how do you align your budget with our strategy? 
So it obviously, you know, the federal drug control budget is, as you think about it, is uh, pretty significant. It spans, you know, 16 different uh, departments and agencies. But historically, if you looked at that budget from 1988, you will see we categorize spending in two domains, right? Supply reduction and demand reduction. Supply reduction meaning, you know, pulling out coca in Colombia and eradicating heroin in Mexico and having the Coast Guard seize cocaine. And I'm not saying that those are not important strategies, but if you look at our spending on health approaches, those demand uh, reduction approaches, it was far below what our supply reduction approaches were, right? So it's, it's a really good example, I think, of how, right? So public policy and federal strategy was largely focused on law enforcement and supply reduction approaches and not on health approaches. Um, and the people who had my position previously, I think, reflected that philosophy and that spending. These were largely military folk, law enforcement officials, and I was actually the first person to have this job that actually had a, a public health background uh, and not a law enforcement or military background. So it was really, uh, I, I think, kind of context for this. You know, and, and, and a lot of that, in no small way, was a function of what are, have been our historic attitudes about people with addiction. So, you know, as addiction as a moral issue, right? So these were bad people doing bad things. And if it's bad people doing bad things, then it, it, you know, it necessitates a punitive and a law enforcement approach to, to what we were doing. Uh, of addiction as a choice, not seeing it as a disease, but these people did it to themselves. Like, so why should we give them kindness and compassion and treatment? This is largely a function of what they did to themselves. No offense to my medical colleagues, but this is largely ignored by the scientific and medical communities, right? So it's still one of the remaining health issues. Uh, I, I'm not a government official anymore, so I can like say what I really think. Um, <laughs> that for a very long time, we, you know, despite the fact that it's one of the most prevalent diseases that our medical community face, we've largely treated it as an optional healthcare activity, right? So this is not an issue that people get routinely trained in medical school. Um, and it's shaped by people's individual and personal experience. Family, media portrayals, language. Think of the language that historically we've used for people with addiction, junkie, addicts, uh, drug abusers. And many people in recovery were anonymous, right? So there's this um, kind of false myth that if you're a member of a 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, that you couldn't be open about your recovery. And that's actually not true. The founders of AA we're very, very public about their recovery. It just means that you're anonymous about your participation in AA, not in the fact that you're recovery, right? So think about the, the juxtaposition between LGBT issues, you know, where people were coming out in the millions, uh, but by and large, people in recovery were anonymous. So, you know, as a, so how does that get reflected out? So this is a survey done by Blue Cross Blue Shield in March, and more than half of people, this is Massachusetts specific, more than half of people believe that the opioid epidemic is a public health issue rather than a law enforcement issue. Good, right? We're moving in the right direction. However, only one in four believe that addiction is the disease and that 28% 28, 28 that believe that addiction is a choice. This is good old Massachusetts, mind you, right? So it's not a national survey. 82% of people believe that it, people who are addicted bear all, most, or some of the blame for their addiction. And the lack of desire to give up their addiction is seen as the biggest barrier. So it shows us, quite honestly, that while we're making some progress in changing public attitude, um, um, that we still have a long way to go. And uh, I think this is really um, interesting about how those public attitudes, how our feelings about people with addiction really drive public policy. So this is a survey done by some of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health that really looked at even when you compare to what people think about people with mental health issues, that um, uh, uh, public policy and what people think about people with addiction uh, is dramatically uh, less sympathetic. So unwilling to marry into a family, unwilling to work closely on the job. Discrimination is not a serious problem. Uh, employers should be allowed to deny employment. Landlords should be denied, uh, should be able to deny housing. Uh, one of the other data points that I didn't put in here is that people with uh, addiction uh, uh, are not entitled or should not be entitled to a treatment benefit. 
right? And, and I think those of you who have worked in this field know that we have long history of insurance discrimination as it relates to a, a, a substance use disorder and even mental health benefits. So I think it's a really uh, kind of uh, a good example about how public opinion kind of drives, uh, continues to drive public policy as we think about those issues. So how do we begin to change the conversation uh, around these? Well, personal narrative is one um, that, you know, numerous studies show that knowing someone affects our, our perception and our attitudes. And emotions appear to change people's attitudes more than science and data do. So despite the fact that you're all probably really smart people, regardless of your political leanings, we are all victims of confirmation bias. So numerous studies showed that it's very hard once you have an attitude, even presented with conflicting data, you have a tendency to disregard it. Right, so you know we all do that. Um, there's actually a very interesting New Yorker article not too long ago that talked about the role of confirmation bias. So um, one of the things that I think has been really helpful in changing the narrative and changing public policy is unexpected messengers, where we really saw and began to see law enforcement officials as really powerful spokespeople. Right, so many of you heard law enforcement like starting to say we can't arrest and incarcerate our way out of this problem. Uh, countless law enforcement officials, you know, calling actually for more treatment, not more, uh, um, uh, not more uh, arrests and incarceration. We also have unexpected messengers in conservative congressional leadership, right? So one of the most surreal experiences of my life was spending two days with Mitch McConnell in Kentucky. Um, and I think that we saw here, and you may have misgivings uh, and criticism about you know, the legislation, but this is probably one area where uh, we have bipartisan support in Congress focusing on this issue. It's really um, uh, uh, helpful. You know, clearly the opioid epidemic has been a significant change agent in these issues, as well as media coverage, but I think some of the media coverage uh, has been problematic. Uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of advocacy from parents and the uh, recovery advocacy community. Many of you have heard stories of parents who are very public about their children's struggles. We'll put it in people's obituaries. And again, think of the parallels with HIV and AIDS, right, where New York Times would not even publish for a very long time the fact that people died of HIV and AIDS. And now we have, now we have parents who, you know, trying to diminish some of the stigma by doing that. Uh, simultaneously, broad-based criminal justice reform, trying to really look at how we move people away from arrest and incarceration, particularly for low-level drug offenses. Uh, changing the language of addiction, and my good friend and colleague Rich Sates has written a lot about this, of, of looking at, uh, we, know, uh, we know that language plays a powerful role in shaping people's uh, opinions, and we know that continuing to use uh, stigmatizing uh, language um, uh, uh, factors into our approach here. Um, uh, a colleague of ours, Dr. John Kelly, uh, at Harvard did this really interesting study where he gave trained clinicians, right, so we're not talking just the lay public, trained clinicians uh, two nearly identical scenarios of someone with an addiction. And in one, the only change in one he talked, he referred to the person as a substance abuser, and in the other one as a person with a substance use disorder. And what he found out, even among trained clinicians, is statistically significant differences that when you referred to someone as a substance abuser, it elicited a more punitive approach versus when you refer to someone as a substance, as with a substance use disorder, a much more therapeutic. And think about it, abuse implies volition, it implies choice and intent. Um, and I will say, you know, uh, probably an overall return to science in the Obama administration that we saw. I, I do want to talk a little bit about the opioid epidemic as a change agent, and some of this, quite honestly, has been hard uh, to watch, um, even though I think it's overall beneficial in terms of changing our approach. But, you know, um, think about uh, largely driven by overprescribing and pharmaceutical companies, right? And so all of us have heard the narrative of the honor roll white kid from the suburbs who has an injury who becomes a dick. Right, so you know we're not talking, uh, you know, about um, uh, uh, you know the fact that uh, you know many of our communities of color have been dramatically impacted by opioid addiction for a very long time. But read innocent victims, and you know, having kind of lived uh, and worked through the AIDS crisis, we had similar issues, right? So you had gay men, intravenous drug users, prostitutes, immigrants, who were the bad ones, right? And then the innocent ones were like the hemophiliacs and the babies, right? So, so it's this narrative about who is 
uh, um, uh, impacted by this. I was referring to dem demographic changes. You know, up until recently, this has been largely that this epidemic, uh, and again, you know, where many of our communities have been long impacted, you know, this most recent opioid epidemic has largely affected a white community. Um, and again, I think that that frame and the intersectionality between racism and uh, uh, stigma uh, really has uh, played a role, but it began to shape people's opinions, particularly red states that we had many people, you know, uh, many of our most conservative states have been significantly impacted by this. It's also been deeply personal. There's been a number of surveys, uh, Bob Blunden at Harvard, Kaiser Health Survey have shown that many of us know people now, right? So this has become, this is not just an abstract concept. This is not just people who are, uh, who are on Mass Ave and M Melanie at Cass Boulevard. This is now people in their own communities. And increased visibility of people in recovery, particularly among youth. Um, you know, I, uh, many of you know, and uh, Wendy talked about the fact that, you know, I'm in recovery and I was very public about the fact that I was in recovery. And, and, and part of that reason was to, you know, continue to try to decrease some of the stigma and change the narrative. And I also challenged other people in recovery uh, to be public about that. And also spurred an increase in advocacy, especially among parents. So, you know, what, how we frame stories matter. And so this becomes particularly important as it relates to addiction. So frames that em emphasize blame and responsibility of individuals elicit higher levels of stigma and punitive policies. And those where much more sympathetic stories describing the experience of people or family members elicit lower levels of stigma, greater support for public policies that benefit this population. So, you know, uh, how we frame stories matters. And here's a really good example of that. Um, around naloxone. So I think all of you know that part of what uh, we and many other people have pushed was more widespread distribution of naloxone uh, among law enforcement, anybody who's wit uh, who can witness an overdose. And here what you, you I think see pretty dramatically is that factual information and even sympathetic narrative alone uh, doesn't uh, 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 have modest increases in terms of support for those policies. But when you can combine a sympathetic narrative um, with factual information, that that's really uh, helpful. My colleague uh, from Maine, will, uh, we were reflecting on some of the comments from Governor uh, Paul LePage in Maine, who basically was saying, uh, who did not support a state law, uh, luckily uh, it happened uh, over his objection, uh, around naloxone distribution and basically saying, ah, just let those people die and then we won't have to take care of them, right? So, uh, you know, again, just where we have these really kind of unsympathetic narratives. So, um, but if it's your child, uh, you know, if it's your neighbor's child, obviously you have a, 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 a much more, uh, likely to demonstrate much more support for those policies. So, so this is my very, very uh, abridged list of kind of uh, outcomes. So where are we now? Where do we need to go? And again, while we still have an extraordinary long way to go in continuing to change and educate the public about uh, addiction, and as we think about those roles of personal narrative, I think we're beginning to see a change that, uh, and a growing consensus that substance use disorders are health conditions. And again, say what you want about, uh, you know, what Congress did or didn't do. One of the, the overriding arch of uh, federal policy um, largely focuses on health-related conditions. So we did not see a lot in legislation to do that. A significant uh, uh, retreat from arrest and incarceration. Um, and uh, uh, again, we still have a long way to go. Some of you are familiar with the law enforcement assisted diversion program uh, begun in Seattle, um, where, whereby uh, pe people who have repeated interactions with law enforcement, instead of being arrested, uh, they have case conferences of every social ser service agency and try to get them into care. Uh, another one is uh, PARI, the Police Assisted Addiction Recovery Initiative, started right here in Massachusetts by Gloucester Police Department. So Gloucester Police Chief says, I'm not gonna arrest people anymore. Anybody who needs help can come into the police station. We'll actually get you help and case manage you through care. Uh, being replicated all across the country. So as well as widespread naloxone distribution. Uh, for, uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act includes a substance use treatment as one of 10 essential health benefits. We've seen the remarkable increase in access to treatment, particularly in those states that have expanded Medicaid. Um, and it was the first time in the history, largely because of the Affordable Act, it was the first time in history 
that federal spending uh, at the end of the Obama administration was the first time in the history of federal drug policy where actually our spending on health approaches equaled our spending on supply reduction and law enforcement. We were hoping that that trajectory would continue. Uh, I think it, the jury is, uh, is still out. We were able to work with Congress at a time when Congress wasn't doing much of anything uh, to get a billion dollars out as a drop in the bucket, but it was, a be you know, it was the beginning to do that. And, and lastly, uh, one of the last things our office did was send out uh, guidance to our federal agencies to uh, use only um, clinically appropriate destigmatizing language. And I think all of us were glad to see that the AP Style Guide, which is the journalist Bible for how you report on addiction, sent out a revised language actually asking people to use um, uh, only non-stigmatizing language. Uh, I'm afraid that the New York Times probably has not gotten that message yet. Um, but, but I think it's really, again, important to think about you know, the framing and the language of what we do really matters. And, and again, you know, uh, I, while I think media coverage has also been um, helpful in articulating the magnitude of the epidemic, uh, the overriding narrative in media that you'll see is that people don't get better, uh, that there's not solutions. Uh, and and I, we, I think, have been challenging the media to try to have much more balanced coverage uh, and scientifically appropriate coverage as it relates to issues of addiction. So uh, I'll end there. Thank you for your time. Uh, looking forward to the rest of the speakers here. Thank you.